Good morning or good evening or whenever you're listening to this. This is Andy Simon from Save Open Space and this is the Save Open Space uh, show, uh, Save Open Space Burlington. Um, with me today are Diane Geyer and Ruby Perry. All of us are South End residents and we work together on Save Open Space Burlington. Also uh, not present, but very much um, active in our group is Jess Rubin, who um, is uh, the um, uh, director of Myco Evolve, private company. She has an MS in environmental studies and is in uh, doing an MS again in plant and soil sciences um, in uh, ecological landscape design. So today we're here to talk about the Pine Street Barge Canal. And um, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of what the Pine Street Barge Canal is. Um, we're talking about a, a, a piece of land uh, along Lake Champlain on, on the south end of Burlington um, and uh, in uh, what's called an environmental, or I mean, a, a enterprise light manufacturing zone. So a historically um, uh, manufacturing zone in the south end of Burlington. Uh, you can see on the map right next to, next to the, this uh, piece of uh, vacant, what they call vacant land, a forested land is the Burlington Electric Department just down from that where it says St. Johnsbury Trucking is actually now Department of Public Works. And to the, in the lot, uh, left uh, bottom corner of the screen is Callahan Park. Um, we talk about it as an industrial zone, but actually prior to any of this, it was a wetland that was just along Lake Champlain. And um, what happened to this land in the 19th century was first the railroad came in, so it cut it off, pretty much cut it off from, um, the, from the lake, but there still was a connection um, to the lake. And then this, what's called the barge canal was dug as a way of um, storing lumber for the lumber industry in the area, which was the primary industry in that part of the 19th century. So this, this is a glimpse of, or a, a rending, rendition of, um, of the, the, the part of the barge canal where, where lumber was stored. And this is actually why it, was, why it was created, the canal itself, as a way in from the lake to bring lumber in so they could store it for the winter um, when the lake froze up and the mills could keep, keep operating with Canadian lumber that was brought in uh, on, on barges. Uh, and so these are the piles of lumber just piled up all around this area that we were looking at just a second ago as a, a natural area. Most of that area is um, uh, fill that um, was filled in from uh, various sources, including the, the sawdust from the lumber mills themselves. So there's a huge peat layer in this area. What happened after the lumber industry um, stopped using it was that in that area that you see on the map that's a little um, uh, red rectangle, there was created a, a manufactured gas plant manufactured gas plant made gas from coal. And that operated from the very beginning of the, of the uh, 20th century to 1966. It was decommissioned in 1966. But in the course of the manufactured gas plant's operation, there was a huge amount of toxic waste that was dumped into the, um, into the canal and into the land behind the manufactured gas plant. This includes uh, coal tar, which, which contains benzene, toluene, uh, various other hydrocarbons, and um, heavy metals. There's, in fact, the EPA has a list of, of 56 contaminants of concern in this area. So in, in the early 80s, uh, the Superfund legislation was created by Congress, and um, this uh, site was designated as a Superfund site, which means it's under the control of the, the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency. And that sort of sets the scene for um, what we're looking at now uh, and, and what we would like to propose doing with this area. Ruby, do let, you want to? Yeah, let me give you a brief vision to start with. 
um, what you'll see is that in the center of it is um, a parcel um, that it has Maltex pond. It's a big. It's it's really the core of it. That is city-owned land that is and already conserved. Um, it was going to be part of the um, the Southern Connector, and and when they discovered how much uh, talk, talk, uh, pollutants are in the water, and and how they they could not do what they had planned to do. So, luckily, now it is conserved and has been. Um, for 30 years, as has the whole land. So what I'm suggesting and what I want you to imagine is that as the core of, of conserving the entire piece of land. Right now you see it cut up into several parcels that um, go between Pine Street and the railway. It is all wetlands. And what our vision is, is that the entire piece come together. And we want to, uh, invoke perhaps and mention that this land was the land of the Abnaki people and had been for 10,000 years. And we have, as part of our work, asked permission for them uh, of the chief of the Nalhegan tribe to do this work on the land, to even begin to envision it. And we have also begun conversations with the with current Abnaki people about reading that land and how we might best um, we might best serve the the true purpose of the land. So we've been speaking with Judy Dow and Chief Menard and also Megesa as as being as our advisors, and I want to mention them. Uh, now, but also mention uh, that we will be doing a show with them um, about what happened before the in industry came to town um, at another time. So watch for that. Diane, why don't you go ahead and begin to talk about the water part of it? Okay, so uh, sort of the reason I've been on the land multiple times and, and looked at the stormwater is I've run two design charrettes about this part of Burlington. And one was for um, a mayor 30 years ago um, who did who wanted us to put together teams and, and interpret what we were seeing at the time. And this is probably 25 years ago. And then subsequent to that, about mm, 10 years ago, um, we did another community call for all the neighbors in the South End to um, look at this and walk the land and start to wrestle with what is it doing, what are its qualities, how is it functioning, um, all with an ecological design sense. Um, so that leads to the stormwater in the South End. If you look at the purple, um, that's predominantly downtown it's sort of from you know union street and willard and it and it goes into burlington proper um but the lime green in particular um and there's two zones of lime green and then there's a zone of dark green dark green is all of the anglesby brook watershed and that is flowing straight towards the lake so you can see it sort of is the the light blue is the barge canal zone and the wetland zone. So everything that's lime green and dark green are flowing through the barge canal and the wetland. That means predominantly the whole South End. Um, Anglesby both comes into this wetland zone as well as is its own little river watershed, small, small watershed. It's the most degraded stream in Burlington proper. Um, so the functioning of this land as a wetland zone is absolutely critical for the stormwater and sewer lines um, in Burlington. Um, because in the South End, they're not disconnected. There's only a small part of the South End that's actually piped into a sewage treatment plant. The rest is going direct to the lake through this mitigating function of, of the barge, what we're calling the barge canal as a whole location. Um, part of what's also interesting is that um, there are ARPA funds from the federal government currently 
for stormwater mitigation in urban areas. And this would be a place that um, the city plus the state could apply for federal funding um, to help this particular land continue to function in its water storage, flood control, and pollutant mitigation properties. Yes, there are pollutants there, but there are also all the pollutants of urban overflow that are currently coming through there. Um, so it has a critical function for all of those natural resources. And of course, our lake is, is the most critical thing of all. So it, it, it's directly linked to that. Um, should I continue? Diane, do you want to say anything about flood control and its role in flood control as well, or could we should we pass that off to somebody else? Um, well, it's sort of we could we, somebody more engaged with lake research would be good. Um, but just so that we know, it that land is blocked by the railroad, which is all fill and high, um, and so you sort of have this barrier between this land and the lake proper with just a tiny channel that connects the two. Um, so all the water is backed up into this bowl. It acts as a bowl, both a water bowl as well as a sponge of land. Um, so it is critically functioning for the whole South End. And as we develop more of the city, the more we can do to protect stormwater and lake flooding, the better. As we've seen, they've had to rebuild that whole part of the bike path because of, of flooding and storm surges. Um, so this becomes even more critical for all of those future climate impact storms. Yeah. I think, there's, I think the key point of that is that um, this land is already performing a incredibly important function for the city. And we don't know how to really, we don't, we modern humans aren't really able, haven't, aren't calculating the resources that are inherent in the land in terms of flood control. But city of Burlington and the, all of us, the people are aware of climate change and that those things are going to, are already critical and are going to become only more so. And the city has begun to talk about natural nature-based solutions to climate change a wetlands, a functioning, diverse, biodiverse wetlands is key to that. And that our vision is of a functioning, uh, biodiverse <laughs> wetland that is an ecotone between the city and the, a transition zone to, between the city and the lake. And I don't know if we need to remind people that our drinking water comes from the lake. Um, so this is a result of a community-wide or South End community neighborhood um, gathering over three days. Um, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because in this case at the bottom, you can see where the railroad track is, the gray line. And below that in light gray is actually the lake. Um, and what's in blue is the turning basin and the canal and then a wetland zone where there's a little later, maybe it's an H or an I. Um, so, all of that all the way up to Pine Street is all water retention and is all acting functioning ecosystems that are currently thriving and healing all of the previous industrial um, uses that were there. That's why we think this is so critical to um, conserve as an acting ecosystem for the city. Um, you can see those relationships and just to the right, there's the parking. Uh, you're immediately at the um, paved parking of what was once the GE plant. Um, mm -hmm. So as a community, people thought about very light use, keeping this wild, um, perhaps putting in some trails. Maybe they would be more like boardwalks um, so that you're separating people from the land and the sponginess that has to happen for it to be active. Um, and, you know, in places that are perhaps already built up, um, you know, you could, you could have collection points for folks. Um, but the critical thing is 
how to turn it into an environmental learning lesson so that people understand how land is dynamic and how land um, that we think of as um, unused or invisible to us is actually highly functioning and highly critical to the rest of our city. Um, so I think there are different examples of environmental research places that, that talk about bioremediation bio and, and ecological systems. And one of those examples is um, along the Hudson where it was also a huge brownfield site. And um, they put in a barge that's a learning center for um, researchers and students, school children to learn about living systems. Um, and that was highly successful. It's been there for 20 years now. So I just wanna say a word uh, also, I wanna speak a little bit about our image and, and Jess uh, Rubin, who's not joining us today, but who uh, has been working with us, um, did uh, wanna focus on um, the remediation piece and the possibilities for academic um, and citizen science research. And I think that that's really important. And what Diane was saying really leads into that. But I wanna point out that um, this area that is now uh, uh, not built on is all uh, forested and um, is habitat for beavers and herons and, um, and Canada geese and various mammals and uh, fish and amphibians. Um, at one point the, the, in the early 90s or the late 80s, the, the Environmental Protection Agency decided that what we should do with it to remediate it is dig up all of the contaminated land, which is most of the land that we're looking at right now within um, the, the Superfund area, which is the yellow line here, um, should be dug up and piled into a giant uh, toxic waste container right on the lake. Um, that was their, their preferred remedy. And they suggested this to the Burlington community and um, the Burlington community pretty much as a whole said no to this. And so uh, over a period of five or six years after that, um, there was much consultation. And what happened was that the, the land within that Superfund boundary was pretty much left alone. Uh, as an alternative solution to basically digging and dumping all of this contaminated soil. There was uh, some remediation in the, uh, the water uh, area, the canal area that you see, and a cap was put on to keep the coal tar from migrating out into the lake. But otherwise, um, besides monitoring the situation, nothing uh, much has been done to that land. Um, what we see this land, besides having uh, a public function and um, potential access on boardwalks uh, into the land for education, is also a potential um, hub for academic research into phytoremediation that's using plants to remediate it, mycoremediation with mushrooms, bioremediation with bacteria, um, an area that's um, <clears throat> especially in northern climates, is, has not been adequately studied, but many people are interested in it. This semester, for instance, Professor Joshua Faulkner is going to be um, at uh, working on the site with his students, uh, looking at uh, uh, trying to document and, and catalog the contaminants that are in the soil and also strategies for bioremediation. So uh, there's a bioremediation class that already is going to be on working on the site, but there's so much potential for this, both for um, UVM research, other academic institutions, and also um, citizen science research that uh, can be done by Burlington uh, uh, residents uh, to inventory the, the species that are on the land to um, uh, to help and assist the academic research that's going on and to do grassroots remediation that's also another strategy for remediating this. So this, this land is critically important for um, uh, the, 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 the flow of water, the um, uh, sequestration of carbon, the 
stabilization of the soil and for transforming the toxins that are on, on the soil, in the soil right now, which are many. Um, we should probably talk about what um, has been proposed uh, uh, by various developers and, and the city to, um, and then wanna, we wanna talk really briefly about what we see needs to happen. Well, I, I think we should keep focusing on the, um, the vision that we have and then, okay. and then what the steps are because there is pressure on that land to, to develop. And I, I guess I wanted to segue from, from this education piece that we're talking um, basically about 26 acres and it's 11 acres of it and is um, already owned by the city and, and conserved. And of course, that's where we'll start with the remediation and the assessment and the academic science that's happening there, but also a citizen science. But our vision is that we will acquire the two private parcels as well, um, so that that whole, the parcel, the Superfund site can come together as a whole and the wetlands can be reactivated. And we're not talking about the city owning that land, we're, we're talking about a separate entity that maybe perhaps a new model for public ownership um, and th that would be that would really involve the citizens in that land that I keep thinking of Friends of the Barge Canal for um, things like uh, clearly there is a huge amount of cleanup that has to happen. There's a homeless site um, that was there for for years that um, needs to be cleaned up in order for the land to regenerate. Um, but we also need to, we'll, we'll need to remove invasives that have grown in um, and to, to plant and nurture and tend um, native species coming in. So I think uh, our work, and I think we're coming um, our, our work is to, we need to inform ourselves about what's happening and how critical that land is to Burlington. And that part of our uh, vision is that it would not only be an education and training ground for bioremediation, but also about our, our past, the legacy that industrialization has left. Because not only has it destroyed the land, it has, the land has itself begun to heal itself. And that maybe we would have some kind of a, um, you know, a, a walkway that would uh, interpret, you know, would have signs. So it would be interpretive so that people could walk along it and learn not only about the, the, lumber business uh, that happened there and that built Burlington is part of the roots of Burlington, but in the same way, learn about that land as a, a natural area of why Burlington began there and the, uh, the role that um, development of all kinds uh, played in it. So it's a, it's a multifaceted vision that we're carrying. And we want everybody uh, to be involved in that and to understand what that vision is. I would I would add to that 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 it's we're not this isn't new ground. Lewis Creek Association um, in you know the southern tier of Chittenden County has been doing citizen science now for 20 years, yeah. if not longer, and has huge support across the whole scientific community and the neighborhood communities and the towns that participate. Um, and then there are also partnerships. There are other nonprofits out there in the state or federal nationally who we've been talking to and are interested in helping promote how to move forward on this um, and understand why this is really important. And it's a, our, our one critical piece in Burlington. It's a keystone site um, for, for, for all of this, for the learning, for the stormwater, for um, the industrial heritage, um, and all of those assessments are out there. So it's really a matter of us teaming with others to piece it together and to bring it forward. Mm. Yeah. And we do have a petition out and uh, we will uh, 
in uh, uh, you'll see on your screen uh, a petition link uh, for uh, conserving and remediating this land. We have 450 people who've signed already in the last uh, two months and uh, are hoping for many more. Uh, it, uh, it's just another way of um, demonstrating uh, the involvement that people have with this land and the caring that that uh, the community has for years um, felt about uh, about the barge canal land and that um, it needs to be conserved. It needs to be cared for. It needs to be remediated. So we hope that you will uh, join us in that. And um, uh, and on the petition, you'll find links to uh, how to get in touch. You can also make comments and um, find out more information. So maybe we should talk a little bit, if we still have time, um, about the, what the next steps are in terms of that there are two private parcels in particular that are key. The green area that you can see outlined in green and says RCO conservation is area that has been zoned to be conserved already. Some of that, that middle piece is, is um, public land, publicly owned, municipally owned land. The um, strip along to the left side along the railroad is private land. Um, there's some indication since that can't be used for anything else that that will be donated to any kind of conserved land and we're hoping that that happens. The two pieces um, that are numbered five, 453 and 501 are both owned by um, a longtime uh, developer in Burlington named Rick Davis. And he's indicated that he is willing to sell that land for, for conservation. And we're hoping that all of that can be included into a, a conserved uh, forested park and wetland that will be a lasting legacy for the for the city and um, for the, um, you know, for the, the uh, environment that it will be, uh, that the ecological restoration of that area will, will be a benefit to everyone. I think, I think other than the petition, um, once you sign the petition, you'll, you will be able to get updates on what, on the work that we're doing and where you can participate and really where we need your help. So when the, I don't know how, when the petition uh, link comes up, I guess they'll have to write it down, right? And then- The Jordan uh, is gonna add it. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're hoping when weather permits, uh, as, as the spring warms up a little bit, um, to actually do walks on the land with people and we'll, we'll try to get that out in various ways. Um, but at this point, um, many people are using the land. Uh, there are people who walk their dogs there, people who walk along the edge. And you can walk uh, uh, into that land pretty easily just to see it. So if you're down in the south end of Burlington or want to see what it looks like, um, you can definitely um, use that land just respectfully and uh, with curiosity to see what, what's down there. Because there's so many, even in the wintertime, you know, there's a big beaver lodge um, that's active all, all through the year. There's um, animal tracks. If you go in the snow, it's just amazing, astounding how many animal tracks are down there. Uh, raccoon, fox, um, dogs, but um, you know, uh, just you can, you can see a lot of uh, animal activity or evidence and, of it. And you can but, skate. They're and, skating. The uh, barge canal freezes when it's when the ice is, is solid, and it and it will be after this next uh, little bit of time. You can enter through behind Myers Bagel. A um, lot of people do wild skating there, and it is a great way to see the to see the barge canal to be to be in, in that space. What I think is is special about it for Burlington and. Parks and Rec does have sort of wild lands as a demarcation of, of a, a type of property within the Parks and Recs for the city. And um, so I just want to bring up that it is wild. So um, don't expect it to be safe and monitored. You know, if you're going skating, be skate safe. Yes. Um, you know, and know that there are wild animals out there and know that there are potholes, you know, things. And, but that's part of why this is so particularly good 
is it offsets the Callahan parks that are totally manufactured green space as opposed to being wild green space. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. such a huge buffer um, to all of the rest of um, what goes on in a city. I think that the, the, the phrase that came up when we were talking to one of the uh, land trust uh, representatives last uh, weekend was um, natural infrastructure. I really like that. Yeah. It's, it's a key part of the natural infrastructure of Burlington. And, and uh, we are hoping that you will join us in uh, working to conserve this land um, in, in the coming months. Thank you. I Thank think we could end there. Thank you, CCTV. Yes. Thank you, Jordan and CCTV. Jordan, yeah. And we'll be back on the air, especially talking about an indigenous perspective on the Burlington waterfront to go along with this. <laughs>